I've got a report here. Let me see. The Literature Evangelists worked 197 hours. They did 144 demonstrations of their books to the people. They got 21 referrals, 31 orders for $21,222. So your prayers were answered. Um, literature given out, 222. That's free bits. 14 courses enrolled. Three people taken to meetings. Two ex-SDAs uh, visited. 37 prayers in homes with the people. And uh, six Bible studies given and 33 homes open for follow-up. So that's pretty good, isn't it? So uh, thank you very much for uh, praying for our success. And thank you, special thank you to the ladies that provided our savouries for our evening meal. Um, next week we're all going on a diet. Got too fat. <laughs> but uh, really appreciated that. Now let's see what else we've got to do. Oh, yeah. We can introduce our team. Um, each literature evangelist will stand up, tell us who he is or she and uh, where they're from, and how long they've been a literature evangelist. Okay. I'm John Wallace from Kaiko here. I um, have had a seven-year break from literature evangelism, but uh, I've been back for three weeks. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Malivi Fotua, Auckland unit leader. I've done this work for 17 years. In case I forgot to tell you who I was, Tony Wall is my name, Area Manager for, lit for Literature Evangelism in New Zealand, enjoying the work for 35 years and would love to do it another 35 years, but I've just been given another job. I've got to look after all the Adventist book centres in the islands, so I'm gone soon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't think I need to introduce myself to all you faithful members here, but I'm Jocelyn and I've been literature evangelist for seven years now. Yeah, but we enjoyed our work this week. I thought I was going to escape. <laughs> David Askin, eight years, local, loving the work and Looking forward to another more than eight years. Amen. Good morning, Richard Hargreaves from Hastings. I've been doing it for about 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Wangarei Church. My name's Mone King, and I was born in Opanoni, so I fluctuate between Kaikohe, Bay of Islands, and that area. And I've been in, this is my eighth year, praise the Lord. Eh? <laughs> Hi, North Islanders. My name is Angela Croft, and I live in the, North, in the South Island in North Canterbury, where young Andrea was my neighbour over the road, and an immediate neighbour. We, lived, we live on farms, and um, the children used to go riding horses together. And I'm going to tell you a wee story about Andrea's family when I tell you something shortly. But I've been in this work for 28 years and loved every minute of it. Kia ora Church whānau, um, my name is Maria Campbell and I am the unit leader of uh, Central North Island and also the, the Northland and I've been in the work 28 years and loving every moment of it too. I'd like to ask you all now if you're able to kneel as we approach the throne of grace for prayer. What a privilege it is to pray to our Lord, our wonderful Saviour. Oh, dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be here, dear Lord. We're so grateful to congregate, brown and yellow, black and white, whoever we are. We hear your call, and we come here today to worship you, dear Lord, because you are our Saviour. You are our Lord, you are our brother, you are our King, you're everything to us, Lord. We know all about the light that you have given us and taught us about what you have done for us. So we want to follow you, Lord. We want to imitate you. We want to be like you. We all fall so far short, but we thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for your compassion and your kindness. We thank you for your ways because you are the only way the light that you shine into our inner souls 
to reveal this wonderful shining pathway that's always forever winding slowly upwards and along the journey as we go up and around we meet other people and we are able to tell them join us come into the path of light and thank you for your spirit lord that gives us strength to resist all the um temptations that are around us in this fallen world even though it's fallen it's beautiful lord the sun is still coming up beautiful sunsets signaling sabbath has arrived the birds are still praising you we want to praise you like all your created creatures are meant to lord increase our faith dear father so that we will know really know in our hearts that we can ask anything in your name and you will do it for us according to thy will. Because it's your kingdom that's coming, not ours. And it's your way, not ours. Dear loving Father, we just are so captivated by your love that wraps us all up and brings us here today so that we can share your word and share the the joy that comes into our heart when we go to people's home that are yearning for you, that don't know much about you. So we just want to praise you and thank you for this great love that manifested itself in human flesh, our Saviour, you, Lord. So we worship you today in spirit and in truth, dear Lord. In your precious name, we thank you for continuing to call us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let us all stand, shall we, and sing that beautiful hymn, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Called. I hope this is the one we use for the children's story. Would all the children like to come up the front? And I have a little story to tell you. Ah. <laughs> I heard there are lots of lovely girls and boys here at your church. Hi. Well, thank you for coming up the front. The people who are sitting up here are called literature evangelists. And we go around the homes in the town knocking on the doors to find the mummies and the daddies that we can show beautiful books to, that will keep you healthy and well, and that have wonderful stories in them that they can read you at bedtime. How many of your mummies and dads read to you at night time, read you a bedtime story? Oh, isn't that lovely? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time we had books called Uncle Arthur's Bedtime Stories. You probably have had stories from there, especially when you go and visit your grandmas and grandpas. But we've got some new books out called Great Stories for Kids. And how many of you like horses? How many of you have a chance to go riding horses? Do you? Oh, well, for the rest of us who can't go riding horses, I just have come back from Egypt and India and all sorts of places over the world and the three worst things I rode on was a camel, a horse and a bicycle. <laughs> Hadn't ridden a bike for 40 years. But anyway, this story is about a little girl called Janie who used to live in the city but her family moved out to the country. And in the mornings when Janie could open her big bedroom window, she'd look out and the fence between the neighbours like Andrea's place and our place wasn't very far from her bedroom window. And this beautiful brown golden horse would come up and lean over the fence and look at the little girl as she was leaning out her window. And she got talking to this horse and they became good friends. But the little girl, Janie, heard that the horse's owner, he was a big boy, he was going to go away to the city to university. And this beautiful horse, Goldie, wouldn't have anybody to look after him. So one day Janie very bravely went in next door and knocked on the door and met Mrs McAllister. And she said, Goldie won't have anybody to brush him down and look after him every day. So please could I do that? 
And Mrs. McAllister said, oh, that would be lovely if you if you would like to do that. Well, Janie started. She was just fairly nervous because she didn't know a lot about horses, but Mrs. McAllister would help her a wee bit. But the stable was fairly, fairly close to the road, and this boy would be passing by on his way home from school. His name, what's your name? Oh, that's right, because this boy's name was Tom. I didn't know whether to say Tom. Your name's not Tom, is it? Oh, good. Well, Tom would be really mean. He was a bit jealous, really. And he would say, Janie, Janie, bet you can't ride that horse. And Janie said, of course I can. And Mrs McAllister had actually just popped inside this moment. And she said, of course I can. And she kept brushing the horse, brushing the horse, because she'd never really ridden a horse before. And old Tom was so mean, and he stood there, and he kept on going, bet you can't, bet you can't. So Janie said, I can so. And she hopped up on this big horse, and she sat there for ages saying, go, Jim. All the things you sort of say to horses, what do you say when you want your horse to go? Gee up, Neddy. Sometimes. Sometimes. You've got to say something because horses don't really know what to do until you tell them when, when to go. And this horse would not budge. Have any of you older folk ever sat on a horse that would not budge? He'd take you for a ride and then when he got slowly, when he got to the hill and he saw home, he'd go fast, wouldn't he? You know that story. So anyway, this horse would not go, and Tom was getting worse and worse, and suddenly Goldie decided to go, and he flew, and the little girl had no saddle or anything, she was just bareback, and the horse flew through the paddock, and suddenly he stopped. And guess what happened? Poor old Johnny went flying over his head right into the middle of a big pond that he had stopped on the edge of. Oh, and here's that blinking Tom back there, you know. So she gets really bedraggledly wet back to the shed, you know, shoes full of water and dress, dripping with water. And old Tom says, oh, he was laughing his head off because he thought it was so funny. And he says, oh, ha, ha. Anyway, you won't be riding the horse in the school pet show after that. And off he goes home. Well, Mrs McAllister had seen everything that happened and she felt really sorry for Janie. And she said, Janie, we must be patient. Because all these little stories have got a wee lesson in them, and this is a story about being patient. And so she taught Janie the best way to brush the horse down, and she taught Janie how to ride the horse. And when the time for the school pet show came, Janie was up there on a saddle riding this beautiful goldie horse, and old Tom was still as jealous as ever. We've got to find another story how to get rid of jealousy. So one day if I ever come back, I'll have to find your story how to cure Tom's jealousy. But in the meantime, if things aren't going right, just remember, keep working at it. And patience, patience, you'll get to where you're going. So thank you for coming down. Thank you, Angela, for the story. Um, now it's come time for our offering, so if those appointed would like to take up the offering, please. Thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you give us, and especially the cash. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless the offerings we've returned to you and the tithes, so that your work can go forward in this world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us further worship our Lord with uh, hymn number 359. Hark the voice of Jesus calling. After all, the harvest is ripe. Who will go? Let's all stand. Three. The title of our sermon today is called God Calls. And rather than me just stand up and talk, I've got the help of all the literature evangelists. They're all going to have a part, about three minutes each, and they're going to talk about how God has called them in different ways like how God's called them into the church or called them into literature ministry or called them to success or called others into the church as a result of their work or called them to share their faith or a multitude of other things. So the first one is Angela and she's going to tell us how God calls men and women into his church and she's got an exciting experience to share with you. Thank you, Angela. Well, my te text is Revelation 18.4, where God calls people out of Babylon. 
Um, well, we had, my mum had seven aunts in the convent and two uncles priests, and I was a minister of the Eucharist, which is probably about as far as you can get, and I knew I was in the one true church. And um, my very, very, very best friend was dying of cancer when she was about 30. And from the Catholic Church, we'd go out to the New Life churches and try to bring that love back into the Catholic Church. But the men would stand there like this, you know, men, what men are like. They wouldn't shake hands when it was time to shake hands and say, God be with you. But... Um, on a Wednesday afternoon, five of us, two Catholics, Diana was a Presbyterian, and two Anglicans, we'd travel an hour into the city to this Anglican church and go to a healing meeting, which was absolutely beautiful because we went to some where the men were in pink suits or white suits up the front and slaying the congregation. Of course, I went down too because I wasn't going to be the only one standing up. And, um, but this Anglican church had such a gentle service and there I learnt to pray, rather than saying the rosary. I actually stayed with some nuns um, when Malevi's daughter was married about three years ago, and they even read their grace out of a book. I didn't dare say, please bless the hands to prepare the lovely meal. But anyway, they just read out of a book. So Catholics, if they say any prayers in church, it's always prepared and read. So we learnt to pray, and it was, it was actually the first time I ever saw that beautiful little prayer people have on their walls about footsteps. That meant a lot to me at this time. But one day, oh, Diana did actually die, but you know, we were talking in our lesson, I believe, by sleeping, she is healed, and she really got to know Jesus. But one day, I went up, for, up the front. I thought I'd like them to pray for me. And these two top Anglican ministers, you know, being a Catholic, they were so, you know, <laughs> high up. And I said, I would like you to pray for me that I could be filled with the Holy Spirit, understand God's word, and be able to tell other people about it. Um, they said, you already are filled with the Holy Spirit, because I was so excited, you know, just reading the Bible, we had Gospels and Epistles, and one day the bishop came and I actually read the Gospel instead of him by mistake. And my little country church was so embarrassing. But anyway, we learnt to read the Bible and to get to really know God because in the Catholic Church we did know Jesus. He was so close to us. When we were confirmed at 13, we were, we, um, we were confirmed and we, I really, really believed I was filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. In my first communion when I was seven, I really and truly believed that Jesus had come into my heart through the host. But, um, well, they said I already was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, years earlier, Andrea's mum is about my age, and we both had five children. You had, Lois had five. Yep, and I had five. And they're all about the same age, but Andrea was probably two years older than my eldest. And, Lo and Andrea's mum was a little bit shy, but I always wanted to be her friend. But we were Catholics and they were Adventists. And anyway, one day, Andrea's grandfather died. And I thought, uh oh, being a good Catholic, I should do something. So Lois actually, Andrea's mum came down to my place and I said, look, don't worry, he's a good man, he'll go straight to heaven. And Lois said, oh, we don't believe in that. And I thought, uh oh. But anyway, I put my little baby in a pram. I only had one at this stage. And um, I did lots of baking and picked flowers out of the garden. And I took my sister-in-law with me for a bit of support because I didn't know your family at this stage. And took the pram, walked down the road. And I met Andrea's grandma, you know, who just lost the husband. And she was lovely because I was really a bit scared of these people. I didn't quite know what Adventists were all about. And I knew what spiritualists were, or oh, sort of, you know, how people do. And I became great friends of Andrea's mum, Andrea's grandma. So as time went by and I'd prayed this prayer in the Anglican church, one day I went down to meet Ma, Andrea, and she said to me, do you keep the Sabbath day holy? I said, yes, of course I do. You know, if we didn't go to Mass on Sunday, it was a mortal sin. If you died a mortal sin, you died and went straight to hell and... You know, of course I kept the Sabbath. And Ma said to me, 
Well, when you get home, you look on your calendar and you'll find that Sunday's actually the first day of the week and Saturday's the seventh. Well, as a Catholic in those days, we all went to confession. And we knew what the Ten Commandments were. We really knew what the Ten Commandments were. Although my three prayers were the whole of my life, because it was a bit embarrassing, really. I just used to say, oh, I forgot my morning prayers. Oh, I told a lie, but I didn't ever. And I might have forgotten my grace, because oh, you didn't really sin. So anyway, I found out the Sabbath. So I, okay, so I started reading my Bible, and then... Seven years earlier, a literature evangelist had come to my door and I remember him kneeling in front of me with the Bible story and saying, look at the beautiful faces. And um, we bought those books. And that literature evangelist kept my name all those years and when they had a big mission, they put my name forward and here I am in your church. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Now, Richard, our newest coal porter, or nearly newest, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> he's going to come and tell us a story. Morning, family. Morning, family. That's it. <laughs> uh, you got your Bibles? Turn up to uh, Matthew chapter 28. And yeah, we'll just read a couple of texts, texts there. Chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. I think you most of you know this one. <laughs> it says, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Beautiful, isn't it? I, um, yeah, God called me um, into literature, literature ministry uh, in an amazing way. I was um, out of the church for about 12 years. I went actually. I didn't actually go out of the church. I was actually with the Reform Movement in the South Island. I well, we didn't live in the South Island, but I, that's the ones we uh, we uh, dealt with. I didn't even know there was nothing in the North Island until later on. But um, but the Lord led us right around the whole circle again. We came back into the church again in Wellsford, the Tihana Church, where we um, lived in Wellsford there for about seven years. And um, yeah, and simply amazing, the story's too long to tell you but I'll just cut it quite short and sh tell you how the Lord actually um, led me into um, what I'm doing here now. I worked at the uh, Wellsford Primary School as a caretaker uh, for about seven and a half years and I used to, my job was to mop the floor first thing in the morning in the hall on a Monday morning and mop the hall and clean it, you know, toilets and whatever you do. <laughs> it was a good job. And I used to play plenty of music and I used to play the tapes and used to always sing praises to God. I love singing praises to God. He's my uh, best friend. And I always prayed for the Holy Spirit to come in my life. And, and you know, I really enjoyed singing there. I didn't care what people thought about outside. <laughs> but uh, that was good. And uh, one day I was, um, I was actually uh, mopping the floor. I finished vacuum cleaning and mopping the floor. And um, soon this power came upon me. And a small voice said to me that I must be baptised to do his work. And uh, the power was so beautiful. And uh, just took me straight up on my feet. And I'm near, I don't usually hear voices, <laughs> but um, I meet them at the door sometimes. People do hear voices all the time. And we know where that's coming from. Um, and actually, it just took everything away from me, actually. And I thought, wow. And so what do you say when you say you've got to must be baptised to do your work? The first thing I said, yeah, I will, Lord. I will do that. And um, so I was, I was baptised a few months later, which was a bit sooner. And um, that was an incredible experience. And God has been so wonderful to me. He's um, tell you something too in praising God, you know, not even when I was mopping the floor and vacuum cleaning the place, but when you're praising God, praying, I think it's very important too. Uh, always praise God before you actually ask your petitions because um, wonderful things happen to you. One day I was praising God um, at night time, had my eyes shut, and this uh, beautiful bright light was, I don't know, it was in the room, or it was in my mind or something, but it was very intense. And um, as soon as I stopped praising God, the light went away. And... Uh, that's just amazing too. So it's good to praise God. And, you know, just thinking too, I've got another minute, uh, just at this Wellsford Primary School, is at the back of the workshop there, praising God with me tape usually. You know, I love singing. And um, this beautiful bird came and um, started praising God too, you know, singing really loud. It was a beautiful song about Jesus, and uh, I've never forgotten that. And as soon as that song finished, I never heard that bird again. It was just singing that praising, praising God as well, you know. And there's a few other things too, but uh, so that's why I've uh, given my life to Christ to do this work, and to even just coming up here is doing His work or 
um, he had a preaching, doing his work, talking to people. Loved sitting down at the doors, talking to people, doing his work, and uh, putting those beautiful books in the homes. And my vision is putting thousands of books in the homes in Hawke's Bay over the next few years. Thank you, Richard. And, and our next speaker is John Wallace. And I used to work with his father, um, Ian Wallace, years ago as a literature evangelist too. So it's good to see a second generation literature evangelist, isn't it? Thanks, John. Thank you, Tony. My text today is whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. That was Jesus speaking, wasn't it? Matthew 10, 32. And I just wanted to share an experience I had this week. I uh, was working in Morningside, and I knocked on a door, and the fellow looked like he was in a hurry, and sort of, but he did invite me in, and his name was Grant. And I uh, found, found out that he was a, um, uh, an academic. He'd been well-educated in university. And uh, he works in the health field for North, Northland Health. He's got an office at, um, what's that big hospital in the south of Auckland? Middlemore. Middlemore. He's got an office at Middlemore. And he's preparing the Maori health strategy for the next five years. And so we had something to talk about and uh, showed him a lot of health books. He was very impressed with the work we were doing and the books, books we were offering. Uh, he didn't want to buy any, but uh, he noticed as I was showing him through the books and talking to him, he noticed that there's a sort of a Christian influence in them. And he said to me, I think it's really great that you have that Christian influence in your books. And uh, I thought, I wonder where that's coming from. And I started to talk to him a bit about Christianity. And he said, he's comes from a family which has four Christians and there's quite a number of children, I think about seven. Um, but he's not a Christian and you know what happens when you go to university. <laughs> they work pretty hard at educating it out of you. And I think he, he was in that position. He wasn't, he didn't oppose it. He wasn't, he, not, not that he didn't believe in God, but he couldn't bring himself to believe the Bible was true, you know. He couldn't believe couldn't come to the place where he could say he was a Christian. So I was able to tell him my story about why I said I wasn't always a Christian. Um, and I told him my story of how when I was in a crisis, I got on my knees and prayed. And um, it had totally changed my life. Everything changed in my life. And uh, my past, I, and I talked to him from the Bible, I told him how... Jesus offers to cancel our past. All those bad things that are behind us, the things we did, the bad things we think mean that we can't come to God. Jesus cancels our past. And he said, he said, to send it back to me. You mean he cancels your past? I said, yeah. And uh, he gives you a new life. That's why he said you can be born again. And uh, he saw it. I was really thrilled to think that he saw it. And... Um, and uh, we talked for quite a long time about that and, and about my experience and the possibility that men can really believe in the Bible and can believe in God. And uh, so if you'd like to pray for him, he lives um, on that south side of Whangarei. His name's Grant, and I believe the Lord's sown a seed in his heart, and uh, I'm praying that it'll grow. Thank you, John. Now Maria's going to tell us about how God calls others into his church through our ministry. Yes, my text is find, found in Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my wor wor word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in all the things wherever I send it. When I knocked on the store, this lady answered and, and she said to me, I know you. She said, you sold me a Bible about 14 years ago. And she said, you're a seven-day Adventist. And I was really startled. And I thought, wow, I can't even remember her. And I'm trying to think. She says, you do remember me, don't you? And I says, well, dear, it's like this. I've met a lot of people over 28 years and it's hard to remember them all. Anyway, she invited me in and as I got into her home... I could see by the appearance of the house because was, she was um, an arty sort of person and into herbs learning. <laughs> and 
Yeah, so I said, oh, I recognise this house. I've been here before. Yes, it's all coming back to me. And her name was Sharon. And so we had a good chat and she was sharing things about the common things that we had in common about herbs and crafts. And I noticed that a lot of the time she was weaving scriptures in, into her talk with me. And I said to her, oh, what church do you go to? And she said, she doesn't go to church. She said, she just reads that family Bible that she'd bought off me 14 years ago. And I said, wow. I said, well, we're going to open up a youth church. And it would be really nice if you could support it, because you really need a, a home to, um, you know, a church home. And she said, oh, that would be ideal. She said, um, I'm sure that would be really lovely. But I said, oh, it's not going to start for a while because we don't, it only had been a thought in our minds then. And I don't know what made me say it, but I said it anyway. So I got together with my family and we decided to rent um, a school building. And the way that God opened that up, it was a miracle because it was sky high rent, but we only get it for $45 a week. And we were really concerned about the kids that... Um, you know, because you've heard of that case in Rotorua about Nia Glassy that was murdered by these seven, seven people. And we thought, you know, that's in our territory and we need to do something. So we rented a school and we, um, I invited her along. Oh, that's right, I told her. I said, somebody will get back to you. So I gave this contact to um, Orewea and George and they went straight away immediately to see her. And they... Um, she related to them and they related to her and they invited her to church. She didn't come, but she allowed her children to come. She's got two boys and a girl. The girl's about 12 and the boys uh, 10 and 8. And boy, the boys were a handful. They were just about hanging from the rafters for about the first month at church. You really had to have patience with them. But we praise God that um, George and Oriwea were able to nurture them. And then finally, when uh, a couple of Sabbaths ago, they called in to see the mother and they said to her, what excuse have you got this time for not coming to church? They said, because usually she, it's always the house or the children. She's doing things for the children. And she realised that suddenly hit her that she, it was all an excuse. So she came to church. And then um, just this year, she's sold her home and she wants to educate her children, and she's enrolled her, her boy, she's got a bright boy, he's actually going to the seven-day event of school, and now her and the children are uh, worshipping with us every Sabbath with um, quite a few other people too. So I just praise the Lord that uh, we can go out into the highways and byways and bring in these people and save them for God's kingdom. Praise God for fruitful ministries. Um, next one is Malivi. She's going to talk about how God calls us to success. Thanks, Malivi. I'd like to share with you um, where true success comes from. And um, actually, it's not us, it's God that gives us success. It says here, God gives success. It is God alone who can give success. This is from Colporter Ministry, page 83. Um, it is God alone who can give success either in preparing or in circulating our publications. If in faith we've ma we've, we maintain his principles, he will cooperate with us in placing the books in the hands of those whom they will benefit. The Holy Spirit is to be prayed for, trusted in, believed in. Humble, fervent prayer will do more to promote the circulation of our books and all the expensive augmentation in the world. And we believe in that. Um, and I believe that's what, and it's not what I can do, it's what God can do through us. So we uh, hope that some of you will be challenged to be successful, not only in this work, but every work, knowing that God is the one that gives us true success. Have a happy Sabbath. That was quick. I thought Malivi was going to tell us about how she went to the General Conference and all the amazing places she's been around the world as a result of her successful literature ministry. But anyway, um, now we've got an opportunity. Oh, Angela was meant to introduce this, weren't you? The item, you know? Okay. 
Yeah, uh, we've got John's group going to come up and sing a song. Have you got that all sorted out, have you, John? Good. I'll put the words there. John's group is all of them. <laughs> this little song, uh, you'll find it in your hymn book, number 488. <clears throat> and we thought this is very appropriate um, for what we do, and I think as Christians, uh, what we should pray for. So listen carefully to the words. David's going to tell us how God calls us to go the second mile. Thanks, David. First of all, I want to give a big thank you to all these workers up here. We've had a ball. We've had a wonderful time sharing the message with others. Can't hear. Can you hear me now better? I don't want to eat the thing. But My verse is found in Matthew 5 and it's a little verse 41. Whosoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. There's great rewards in doing this sometimes. We don't do it for the rewards. But we do it just because we love the Lord. We want to share the gospel. There's a young lady over in Anuahi, beautiful young married woman with quite a number of children. One day I went there and the family said, oh, mum's in maternity. So we thought, well, I had a strong impression we must go to maternity right away. So we went to maternity and we were told when we got there that she's not letting anyone in. Not even her relatives were allowed in. So I sent a little prayer up to heaven. The nurse went in and asked, I uh, said who was at the door and we got a royal welcome. Come in. And we didn't know what to expect. And I'm not a woman to know what women go through when they're bringing another one into the world. But apparently it's quite painful at times. 
and uh, she, she said, come in. And she was asking me all sorts of medical things. Should I do this and should I do that and the rest of it? And uh, I was humbly giving us what I thought was perhaps the right thing to do. And the doctors and nurses were looking at me. The partner was standing over there, smiling away. Anyway, we, it was about time to go to, um, to the uh, theatre and uh, she wanted me to come, come, wanted us to come too. I said, no. I said, well, have a prayer and God will do the rest. That little boy's got, his, got my name tagged on him. I'm not the, not the father, don't get me wrong. <laughs> that little boy's right here today and his mother's smiling away. Cheryl is her name. God bless you. The rewards are great. Thank you, David, and welcome, Cheryl. Uh, now, uh, Monet is going to come and tell us how God calls us to bring a message of hope. Well, that's what we're here for, aren't we? To give hope to whoever we bump into as God's ambassadors. What an what a privilege, isn't it, to be a co-worker with the Most High? And yet so uh, a really humble Most High when I mean, you look at Jesus. So just following his steps. Um, my scripture comes from... Well, I like that scripture in um, is it Titus 2. It goes along about the grace of God. That's all-encompassing. 2 verses 11, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and then it goes further on down, as we seek and wait for the blessed hope, the revelation of Jesus coming face to face, imagine, I mean, what a message to um, share with people, you know, when you knock on the doors, and just the other day, this sort of relates to um, David's experience. Because the Lord is so amazing, you know, one of us may go in and plant a seed. Some of us years later might knock on the same door, you know, especially when we have outreaches and um, we're canvassing all over where David and Jocelyn have been and even um, Maria's worked in this area. So sometimes we come upon, you know, where um, there's been a soul that has got the books and so we can add another layer. You know, light gets brighter and then strength and all that. As we were singing just a minute ago, it's a beautiful hymn. And faith can increase so we can ask. All wrapped up in love. Anyway, this lady, knock, knock, knock on the door and she was sprawled out. I don't blame her. It was a dreadfully hot day. You know, it was lunchtime and I'd just finished plunging into the waters of the owner. I couldn't resist, you know. We were <laughs> it was absolutely sweltering, and I thought, oh, hydrotherapy, that's a gift from the Lord, so I plunged in, you know. And you're dry within minutes, so it doesn't matter what you're wearing. <laughs> you know, that's hydrotherapy, it's wonderful. It increases your respiration and your circulation, and all of a sudden you're perked up again, so knock, knock, knock. And this poor lady, you know, she was absolutely sweltering, sprawled out there with all her children, and... Um, I didn't want to sort of, um, you know, because she was really not in the mood, but she staggered to the door. <laughs> and rather than invite me, and I said, oh, look, there's a table over there on your foyer. So um, we were going through the canvas. She was sort of waking up, you know. <laughs> and then suddenly she saw the books. And she said, oh, she said, I've got those. Um, these two angels come and visit me so often. And she told me about the story of how she was having her baby. And um, they turned up, Cheryl, you know, and um, and so she, she was telling us, I've heard that story, it came from, you know, Jocelyn and David have shared it with us. And so, you know, we talked and talked and talked and talked. And I was about to leave and I looked at her hair because I used to be a hairdresser and I said, oh, who's been hacking at your hair? <laughs> <laughs> and Maria said, go and get your scissors. So <laughs> So within minutes she was transformed. <laughs> Stand up, Cheryl. You're back. There she is. Turn around. That's the baby that um, is named after David. His name is... Uh, is it... Praise the Lord. I, I've had a lovely time with Cheryl. 
and, and uh, t- talking about, I said, do you know what Adventist means? You know, do you know what Seventh Day Adventist? Not many people realize the meaning of this, you know. Oh, you're Seventh Day Adventist, you know, but do they really understand what it means? So we started with Adventist, you know, the coming, the returning of the Lord, because she's a born-again Christian. You know, okay, she understood that. Oh, she was saying, really? I said, yes, he's come returning with all the holy angels and her children who are listening. And we're going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air and we're going to heaven for a thousand years. <gasps> you know, we were, <coughs> it was absolutely just wonderful looking at the children's faces, you know, and some of them were teenagers. And how long are we going to be there, you know? And what's going to happen to the world? All these questions. And... Um, what about hell? I said, well, I said, hell is going to be just cleaning up this whole planet that's polluted, and it's really designed so that Satan and the evil angels can be destroyed so that we'll have no more evil. And, you know, and we talked about along those lines. And then, okay, then we got to the seventh day. Seventh day. So we went back to, first of all, I just took her to, um, she said, oh, show me in the Bible. So we had to go inside and she got all her Bibles out. And we went to that beautiful scripture in Isaiah 58. If you honour the Lord, you know, not doing your own thing on my blessed day, you will be like a well-watered garden, you know, like a tree that its roots go down to the river, to the waters of life. And whatever you do will prosper and you will bear fruit. <laughs> then we went back to creation, the seventh day. Then we went to her calendar. <laughs> and she was, it was clicking. You could see it in her eyes and in her demeanor. And um, wow, I explained to her about the sunset, you know. It comes in its sunset and it's a special time. Because we've got, we're so busy during the week, aren't we? We're so busy on Sunday, aren't we, in our gardens, weeding and all this, that, and the rest all doing work, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the stress of it all, you know, and then it's bills to pay. Do you all get bills? (laughs) (laughs) And you're worrying about this and worrying about that, but, you know, underneath it all, yes, those are the things that the Lord expects us to go through and ride through with him, you know. But when the Sabbath comes, as I was explaining to Cheryl, Wow, and she was understanding because we were looking at the scriptures. And here she is, so welcome to your new family. And I know you're all nurturers here, aren't you? We've got Pauline and we've got all the others. We've got Loretta over there. Loretta's been lovely to um, people like you, like my niece, Dulcie Jr. She's prospering, but you know, it's still an up and down road here, aren't we? We're still here on earth, aren't we? Any of you gone ahead? No. We're all still here. <laughs> Pinch yourselves, are you? Yes. Of course. So praise the Lord. There's the blessed hope and welcome to our wonderful gathering here in Whangarei. Cheryl, praise the Lord. Pardon? Oh, briefly I shall tell you about God works in mysterious ways. And another hot day in Kaikoi. <laughs> so I had to withdraw, so I thought, where can I go? So I thought I'd go up. It's best to go up, isn't it? Why go down? Because if you go down like the woman, or the, or the, the end door woman, she was down. Now you, you always go up, don't you? When you want to rest in there's trees and there's breezes. And anyway, so I thought I'd go up to the monument where Honeheke's monument is. Have you heard of Honeheke? Great big chieftain, powerful warrior, proud man. I felt quite sad walking through this um, park. Beautiful old, old koko trees. That's how Kaiko is named after the koko berry. The birds eat them, and if you're really hungry, you can eat them too, because berries are really good for you. Blueberries, blackberries, koko berries, and so on. Have a berry pie. Very, very good pie. Anyway, where was I? I was reading about Hone Heke and the, um, the tragedies that he went through, and um, there was a lament there. <laughs> It's good to laugh, isn't it? It's medicinal. <laughs> anyway, um, and how he had cut the flag staff down and how all his relations had been murdered and killed. Isn't war horrible? Actually, war started in heaven, didn't it? Satan is down here and it's continuing on. <gasps> Thank goodness Christ is coming back. And anyway, I thought, oh, Lord, how sad. Please, lead me to somebody special that only you can lead me to in Kaikohe. 
And as I was um, exiting this beautiful park, I um, noticed some violets, beautiful violets, and they were different type of violets, sort of miniature violets. Anybody got any miniature violets? They hang and shoot up and open up and face the sun wherever it goes, the sun of righteousness. So I couldn't resist picking some of the flowers, and I sort of pulled, and some of the roots came out. So I ripped them, put them in my car, and went home and planted them. The next day I said, Lord, walk with me, Master. Send angels on before souls there are waiting. Please, Lord, lead me to the door. Make me a fisher of men. And Lord, be with me moment by moment in case you come today. You know. So I went down this road, down that road, up this road, and I came to Rangi Hamamana. I went slowly along. Where am I going, Lord? And I went past too far, and I came back, and he said, turn around. And I went into this driveway, looked at the door, looked at the window, and I saw movement in the, you know, sudden flurry of garments. <laughs> so I didn't rush over to the door. I thought I'd give her time, you know, to adorn herself with a robe. And... Um, Anyway, she came out, bustled over to the, I uh, pretended I was, um, I said, oh, hello, how are you? You know, I'm from the Home Health Education Service, we're calling on everybody up and around this area. You know, I think I said that. Anyway, um, she's telling me about all her woes and um, she said all of her um, grandchildren living with her and she's having problems with the government department, so much so that she had to go to the doctor the other day depression and stress and um, get some pills, you know, to soothe her jangled nerves, you know. And, um, you know, I started showing her the books Less Stress and relating it to chewing on walnuts and tofu and that and the stress will vanish, you know, and sniffing on lavender and things like that to soothe one's jangled nerves, you know, showing her these beautiful Things that were in Eden, like lavender over here and balm over here, you know, all comes from the balm of Gilead. One <laughs> okay. So she said, right. I said, what's your name? I was writing out the... <clears throat> and she said, Violet. Remember I picked the violets? Hickey. I said, oh, Violet Hickey. I said, well, well, well. I was in um, the Huni Hickey... Um, what do you mean, Park? Said, are you related to Honeke? He said, oh, yes, yes. I actually kept my maiden name because I'm related to him, and um, he's my great, 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 great ancestor. What's the Maori name for ancestor again? I should know. Tupuna. Well, I said, I was just praying to the Lord when I was up there at your great, 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 great grandfather's monument. And here I asked the Lord to send me to someone, and I've come to you, and she was in such distress. You know, and she's just drinking in the books that we're taking in. I visited her a week ago, and, you know, she's a Mormon lady, but I've invited her to our congregation so that she can meet all the other people there. God is amazing. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Monet, for the entertainment. Now we've got Jocelyn, who's going to talk about how God calls us to encourage people to have healthier lifestyles. Well, I'm sorry I don't have the that Monet has, <laughs> uh, nor the experiences, but I just want to refer to John 10, verse 10. I can't see it. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Well, we have this lovely Maori lady who is actually a Mormon. She lives up here in Otangarai. And we called on her and she was interested in our book. She's a lovely Christian lady and she signed up for some books. That was good. And she just kept paying, so we just kept delivering books. She has most of our books now. and. Uh, not the last time we went, but before that. She's a big lady. She said, the doc I went to the doctor because I wasn't very well, and he said I had to lose some weight. And he suggested that I cut out meat out of my diet. So, uh, and she's trying to be a vegetarian. So we said, well, do you like our vegetarian books? 
So we showed her what we have and she got four or five of our vegetarian cooking books and recipes. And the next time we went back, she said, I've lost seven kilos. So that was good. She's a lovely lady. She has a big family and uh, she's losing weight. So that was wonderful. We enjoy going to see her and delivering books. She's nice. Yeah. Looks like we're running out of time, so I better make this short. But uh, the next stage is that God is calling for people to serve him in literature ministry. And you've heard the stories, you've seen their excitement, and uh, if I hadn't have got them to stop, many of them would have just carried on telling lots and lots of stories, because we've got lots of stories. So many things happen in this work, you just never know. Last month I was, not last month, last week I was in Tikawara, and I saw a lady and I was showing her the books, and she said to me, don't sell me these medical books, you've already sold them to me 20 years ago. So I, I had to swap over to medicinal health rather than conventional health and sold her $700 worth of medicinal health instead. But we, we see lots of people and uh, they love our books and uh, our best customers are the ones that have had them before. And, uh, you know, God wants more people out there selling books. Just imagine if in Whangarei we had three or four more people selling books. There's so many people we've missed this week that they go to work. We should have been there at night time maybe. Or there's so many people we just can't visit because we just haven't got the numbers to get out there and visit them. And there's complete towns that are empty, like Whanganui Church. I used to go to Whanganui Church years ago. And if you didn't get there early, you wouldn't get a seat. Now if you go there, you've got all the seats because no one goes. It's finished. Tai Happy Church. Um, finished. Nobody there. And lots of churches are closing down in the rural areas. Uh, because we haven't got literature evangelists, but I promise you, if we could put a literature evangelist in Whanganui, we'd have a church that's thriving. Um, or if we could put one in Tai Happy, we'd have a, the pastor Van, what's his name, from Palmerston North. Uh, oh, I forgot his name. Anton Van Wick. He rang me up a few days ago. He said, please, can you get a literature evangelist to go to Tai Happy? It's, we're just going to lose that church if, if we don't get a literature evangelist in there and stir up some interest. And I said, what about Whanganui? He said, yeah, we need one there too. And, uh, you know, we need them in so many places because the, I don't know what we're doing with our faith. I think we think it's like an egg and you've got to sit on it and hatch it because uh, we're not getting out there and sharing it. Most Adventists are more exclusive brethren than Adventists because uh, nobody seems to know about Adventism around the show. You know, they, they know about Mormons and they know about J-dubs. In fact, they mistake us for them. And I tell them, look, I'm awfully sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not good looking enough to be a Mormon and I'm not intelligent enough to be a J-dub. You know, I'm from the Home Health Education Service, and we sell them some books. But we need more. We need more. Ellen White said, the book work should be the means of quickly giving the sacred light to the world. She says, our publications sent forth from the printing houses are to prepare a people to meet God. You know, people aren't prepared for the second coming. Half the church is not even prepared for the second coming, let alone the world. Uh, so we, we need to get out there and do something. And if you're wondering if you're going to get six, success, don't worry about it. It says here, to every worker, Christ promises the divine efficiency that will make his labours a success. So isn't that good? Cold Water Ministry, page 5, a promise there. If you're wondering what work you should do, it says here, this is the very work the Lord would have his people do it this time. So if you could send Jesus a text message, he would send it back. He would say, this is the very work, you know, he would have his people do it this time. But it's not for everyone. I promise you, it's not for everyone. There's no place in literature of ministry for slackers, all right? In fact, every time God called anyone to work, he called workers. He didn't call slackers. Matthew was called from his lucrative tax collecting post. John was called from a successful fishing partnership. Luke was called from a flourishing medical practice. Elijah was called while farming and working the plough. Moses was called while on a long-term shepherding position. Paul was called from self-employed tent making. Gideon was called while thrashing out grain. Nobody was called from being on the dole. So if you're on the dole and you're thinking, oh, I might try literature evangelism, forget it. We only interested in, pe and God's only interested in people that have got a good Protestant work ethic. They know how to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and get out to work, or preferably 6 o'clock and go for a run first, uh, and who are willing to work 35 to 40 hours a week. If you're not willing to work for the Lord, forget it. But he's looking for workers. 
He's looking for committed people. God's looking for people that are willing to share their faith and share his literature to the community. If you're one of those people, let me know because we're ready to sign you up for literature ministry, train you up with a, a sales course and uh, get you ready to earn a living on the door sharing his truth. And uh, now we'd like to uh, invite you in song to have a part in this work. We're going to sing the song, Come and Join the Bookman Army. It's to the words of, uh, to the music of uh, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, 647, so you'll know the tune. Uh, we might even get the words up there. Yes, we have. So let's go. John, would you like to lead us? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've got a Bookman army. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity to get out and share our faith through literature in the community and uh, that people can know that you are God, the supreme ruler of the universe, and you're coming again to claim your people as your own. We pray, Lord, today that if you are working through your Holy Spirit on the hearts of anyone here in the congregation and if you want them to be a part of this work, please impress them to talk to us, to get on the course the, uh, and, and to learn the work and to be able to get out there and do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, just before we go into the song, I'd just like to thank uh, the Book Evangelists for the work they've done here in Wongrade this week. But most of all, on behalf of the Wongrade Church, I'd like to wish Tony and his wife and family all the best as they take up a new ministry in Melbourne. Tony's done a wonderful job here in New Zealand, and uh, he's what we call one of those stand-up guys, because he'll be back. Uh, <laughs> we won't be, it won't be the last we see of Tony, I'm sure. So, and I wish uh, all the Book Evangelists God's blessing for the, for the rest of the year. Take care and keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> 